Welcome to True Crime and Wine. I am Sherilyn Dale and I am so glad you found me. Today we have no time to waste. We're getting right into it. Before we do, I have a quick riddle for you. What occurs once in a minute, twice in a moment, but never in a thousand years? Today's case is one of those cases where I heard about it a long time ago. This happens often on the channel. I'll, I'll have seen it a long time ago, heard about it, and thought about it so much. And it'll just be one that's like reoccurring in my mind. And I'll want a refresher on it or go a little bit deeper than I had before. And I was able to do that with this case. I had originally seen a program on it on 48 hours mystery I believe did a special on it and then I didn't realize that there was like so much information that was used to put that together that didn't get to be put out there on the episode so there was a book written about it and it was called Nightmare in Napa and um I couldn't stop reading I read it in like a day and I've been included some of the things that I, th I thought that maybe if you've heard about this case, maybe you'll learn something new that you hadn't because I I definitely had. So yeah, that that's a little bit of the backstory of why, why we're talking about this case this week. So today we are going to Napa, California in 2004. I've never been to Napa. It's definitely somewhere that is on the list. No surprise. It's because I'd love to go to like Napa Valley and tour the vineyards very predictable this gal over here but it's known like for more than that is known for beautiful weather the scenery is really beautiful they do have a lot of vineyards but one of its biggest draws to actual residents that live there and at the time there was like only 70,000 um, is that it's a really safe community that was how everybody felt up until November 1st 2004 and it was around 2 a.m so this was Halloween night, but if we're going to be, you know, by the clock going into November 1st, the early hours of November 1st, if you will, when a roommate woke up to sounds of an intruder fleeing her house and just blood curdling screams coming from her roommate's bedroom. This taking place on Halloween night, I think the, the vibe is already a little bit eerie and you're on edge and I'm sure you can conjure up so many scenarios in your head which I think added to the reaction but when when she walked into her roommate's bedroom she found what I would assume is just like beyond anybody's imagination of like a fear or horror of especially of a Halloween night and it changed her life and it changed this town forever. Now, even though Napa is very, very well known and it's a touristy area that a lot of people uh, go to, not just within the United States, but Canada, Europe, a lot of people want to go and immerse themselves in just like the tranquility of what Napa presents. And sometimes when that happens, when you have a lot of tourists coming, it can attract a higher number of crime, but that was not the common occurrence here in Napa up until the point of today's case that took place in 2004. There had not been a homicide in over two years. This was the cliche, we don't lock our car doors, we don't lock our, our houses area. And I got the impression that even on a more eerie day like Halloween, you're still not feeling like super vulnerable. You're, you're, you're pretty cool and you're going with emotions, which is what uh, roommates Adrian Isanya, Leslie Mazzara, and Lauren Minza were doing the Menza? Manza? I don't want to pronounce it wrong. This is what they were doing though. On that, on that evening, they were handing out candy. It was very just light-hearted, really like goo-goo and gaga over the cute little trick-or-treaters that were coming to their house that was on Dorset Street. These three roommates seem to be almost like a roommate match made in heaven. I know that sounds kind of cheesy, but it does, it, it's, it, it sounded like they just had a really perfect vibe, which can be hard to do with roommates, especially if it's like three women, but they all just seemed to click, which people who knew them thought it was a little bit surprising because each one of them were so different. Like it didn't seem like any of them had anything in common at all besides the fact that they were all 26 years old. Leslie was a 
a, a, a small town girl. She had been in some beauty pageants. She was very new to the area. She'd only been there for six months. Lauren was sporty, much more reserved and quiet. And then Adrian was also very into sports, but much more outgoing and vibrant. Like I said, Leslie had only been in the area for about six months, but you'd not have any idea. She was so outgoing. She wanted to make friends with as many people as she could. And she just had this beautiful smile and this energy about her that drew her in and made people think that even if you've only known her for six months, you've actually known her your whole life. She just had that, that, that spark about her. Adrienne grew up in Calistoga. She grew up very close to her mother and she was the middle child of three girls. From a very young age, she showed interest in wanting to pursue engineering when she grew up. So she graduated from Cal Poly and was an assistant engineer at the Napa Sanitation District. People who knew her said she had a very engaging personality, one that brought you in, especially because she had a very kind, warm smile. And she enjoyed baking, but her friends said she wasn't like, like, a, a, sh like a good chef cook, but like really loved baking. I... I feel like I can relate to that. I've learned to love cooking like a lot more because of HelloFresh, but that's because everything's already <laughs> done for me and the work is put out there. But with baking, I don't know. I, just, I do find that more relaxing. So I totally, I could vibe with that for sure. Another thing she really loved was volleyball. She even volunteered as scorekeeper at the Napa Valley Community College. It was through volleyball that Adrian and Lauren, the third roommate, met. Lauren was the quietest she was an all-state athlete with a political science degree. And on her free time, she coached uh, volleyball, played volleyball and soccer, and she basically registered for any adult league that she could, which is how she and Adrian met when they both went to volleyball class at Napa Community College. When they first met, Lauren wasn't living in Napa. She was living close by at the time with her parents. And it was Adrian who kind of got her to come out of her shell. She didn't have any friends in Napa and Adrian kind of claimed her as her. She was like, well, if you don't have any friends, now you do and I am your friend. So when Lauren was kind of looking around in the area wanting to stick a little bit closer, she found a place and it had extra bedrooms. So the first person that she thought of becoming a roommate with was Adrian and Adrian was like, yes, of course. It was also Adrian who kind of brought Lauren into her little inner circle since she didn't have a lot of friends in town. It was Adrian's friends, uh, her very good friends, Ben and Lily specifically, and Lily's boyfriend, Eric, that helped the girls move into their place that first night. Lauren said it was great. The first night they all ordered, you know, I think it's like the staple move-in meal, pizza, and beer on that first night. And it was a really good start to this little, this little living situation between the two girls. The impression that I got was, you know, when you spend time with somebody, they kind of rub off on you. That's why there's very famous or not famous, but popular phrases where you are like the company that you keep. If you want to make changes in your life or be successful and you look up to somebody, try to do your best to spend as much time with that person or those types of people so that, you know, kind of rubs, rubs off on you and you can become a better version of yourself. And that's what it sounded like the dynamic with Adrian and Lauren was. Adrian really helped Lauren come out of her shell a lot more. She was starting to go out and make friends. And some of those friends were another group of girls that were living next door to them. One of the ladies particularly that Lauren really got along with was uh, Leslie Mazzara. She had grown up in Orlando and also in South California with her mother and her two older brothers. And she just had this really bubbly personality. A lot of people have described her as a, a former beauty queen, but there was so much more to her than that. I don't even think that she did an, an, an exuberant amount of exuberant. Any, you know what I mean. <laughs> Amount of pageants, it wasn't her identity. Her mom said that she was 
a blessing to the family prior to her. She had two sons. So her sons were just typical boys. They were just beating up on each other all the time, wrestling, bouncing off the walls, breaking things. And then when Leslie was born, she just saw this side of her boys that she never saw. Very tender. They couldn't get enough of their little sister. They were so gentle and loving towards her. They were a very strong family unit, it sounds like, and that would have been really important because Leslie's mom, Kathy, she had struggled several times. She was a young single mom of three children, and there were moments in their life where they had very minimal things. There wasn't a lot of food. There were times there was no heat in the house, but you'd never really know about those struggles because Leslie was so positive, so outgoing, so kind, so thoughtful towards other people and everybody adored her that met her. Kind of touching on the the beauty queen aspect of it though, I mean looking at Leslie it's no doubt why she she would enter a beauty pageant. She's absolutely gorgeous but she was so beautiful inside as well as out and she wasn't just some like you know, pageant queen who was in it for the crown and taking out everybody around her. One of her biggest missions was to build a platform and use it to advocate for child abuse prevention. This became something very close to her after a good friend of hers was a, a reporter and was had told her about a case that really affected her involving a little girl named Stephanie who had suffered horrendous abuse uh, from her, I don't even wanna call it family, and, and she had died. And Leslie was so affected by this that she worked with legislatures to try and pass a bill called Stephanie's Law. And this required reports of suspected child abuse to be recorded so that officials could have a log and try to detect patterns of abuse. I got that sense that there was so much that she wanted to do with her life. She graduated from University of Georgia and she worked in public relations as a public relations specialist, but she just didn't really know what she wanted to do. There were times where she, you know, wanted to be more political. There, She thought about being an attorney. Uh, she even wanted to be a songwriter. So she was really kind of in a moment of her life where she wanted to do something, make a difference, but just didn't know what that looked like. And so it was her mom that suggested she come and stay with her in Napa. Her mom was living out there temporarily and she thought that that would be a really great place to have a little bit of a reset. When Leslie arrived, she looked for a job that was very out of her of her wheelhouse from things that she had already done. And what better job to try to get when you're in Napa than a winery? And so she actually went to director Francis Ford Coppola's winery, which I didn't even know that he had a winery out there, which is now on the winery list. And it's called the Nibom Co Coppola. Jeez winery and she was hired on the spot I think she even said after it like so when are you gonna hire me and they they were like right now you're hired she was an absolutely perfect fit I think within a, a couple months she had already been promoted three times she was really outgoing everybody loved her the guests especially but so did the staff she was like a like this staple in the winery that they didn't even know that they were missing all of these years. So what started as a summer job to her really turned into a passion. And she wanted to make like the wine business her career. So when it came time for her mom to leave Napa, relocate to Michigan, Leslie was like, no, bro, like I am staying. This this is, I'm feeling the calling. I'm, I'm feeling a lot more on track than, than I was when I got here. When Lauren met her, she said one of her biggest attractions to wanting to be her friend was how opposite they were. Opposites truly attracted in this situation. She was super girly, was really great at makeup, had impeccable fashion, and she was just so bubbly and energetic and had a way of making you feel so special that when Leslie's roommates were leaving their place next door to Adrian and Lauren, the girls asked if she wanted to move in with them instead. And so she did in June 2004. 
I just want to kind of preface this next part to give a little bit of explanation just because I want it to reflect why Lauren, her thought process was the way that it was on that Halloween night and not to turn it into any form of shaming or anything like that. That is just, that is not the, the goal here at all. It's just to give a little bit of context in a couple of weeks prior to what happened on Halloween night taking place. And like I said, the, the three roommates, they seemed to click. There was really no rift or anything like that. But two nights before Halloween, a fella that Leslie had been spending time with, this was not hard for Leslie to get a date or have gentlemen interested in her. Like everybody wanted to date Leslie. And so it's not surprising, you know, this good looking, bubbly, energetic, fabulous woman has has some male company and invited one you know one of her her male friends to come and spend the night at at her house keep in mind this house is is very tiny i think it's only 900 and some square feet so you're all living very close together it's not one level there's uh, upstairs where Leslie and Adrian had their bedrooms and then Lauren's bedroom was on the first floor, but you could just basically hear everything. And so that evening, the, the other roommates were able to hear a little bit of the interaction that Leslie was having with her friends. And this was like the first time that any one from the opposite sex had like come home for the night and that had happened so there hadn't really been like a discussion about the rules so if you want to call it any form of like rift between them that was the only the only thing that had happened they talked about the next day like okay how are we going to move forward with this and it was just kind of like um we're you know like we're grown women and Sometimes we might want to have a, a gentleman over and we will do our best to just keep it within the confines of our room. But, you know, apologies if if you hear something unexpected, but definitely we'll try to keep it on, on the down low. And then everything was good, okay? So there's no like, you know, S S L U you know what shaming or anything like that. I just needed to give context. And it was actually Lauren's dog, Chloe, that had more, more of the issue. She was a protector, uh, part German Shepherd. So anytime she heard noises, she was barking. It sounds like that was kind of like the most frustrating thing for Lauren particularly to contend with. So that's why on Halloween night, Adrian and Leslie were the ones that were primarily hanging out candy to uh, the little ones because Chloe was not fond of the doorbell really ringing or kids coming up to the door. Lauren said like Leslie and Adrian actually got a kick out of it. They were loving the costumes and they were kind of laughing that Chloe was getting all worked up being like, oh, you're, she's such a good protector. They finished handing out candy around 9 p.m. and then everyone just kind of laid low for the rest of the night. This year, Halloween was on a Sunday, so there was no big plans to go out and party or anything. They all had work the next morning. Adrian did briefly leave the house. She left for about an hour or so to go and see her on again, off again, boyfriend Christian. And then Lauren and Leslie just stayed home and they watched a couple episodes of Six Feet Under together. Lauren said she went to her room around 9.30 just to chat on the phone. And she said around 10, Leslie called to her to say goodnight. They said goodnight to each other. And according to phone records, around this time, there was a call that came through on Leslie's phone. And it was from her ex-boyfriend, Lee, his father, Lee Sr. So Lee Jr. was her boyfriend. And then Lee Sr., his dad, was calling her. And based on accounts from Leslie's friends of this situation, Lee's dad did call quite often. It seemed like he couldn't really get over the breakup as well as like his son did. Not that his son handled it well, but he he wasn't calling by any means. He was just, he felt like he lost the love of his life. And then his dad was the one that was kind of calling all the time. And she told her friends it made her uncomfortable. It was actually the reason why they said Leslie told them she broke up with Lee because she didn't like the vibe. He would come on kind of strong. He would show up unannounced. He'd call her even when they were still in a relationship and she didn't really want to be in a long-term commitment or get married to somebody with a family member like that. 
Most of the times when he called, she didn't answer. She was really sweet, though, didn't want to offend anybody. So there were times that she did take the call. That night, though, right before she went to bed, she didn't take the call because it was the second time he had called that day. Around 10.30, Lauren said that she had finished her call. She was back to watching Six Feet Under when Adrian came home. And Adrian just said, like, it was a really long day. She was exhausted and she just was going straight up to bed. So they said goodnight. Lauren also decided that she was going to call it a night. She locked up the house and went to bed around 11 p.m. Just a quick refresher of the, the layout. Adrian and Leslie's bedrooms were the ones that were upstairs. And then Lauren was on the main bedroom main floor bedroom. Everyone is sleeping and then all of a sudden around 1 a.m. Lauren wakes up to the sound of Chloe growling. She's not quite barking yet but she calls it a, like a warning growl and she's looking out the window. Lauren peeks her head out and she sees that the security light above the garage has been tripped so she just kind of dismisses it like one of the cats is in the area. This has happened before. Doesn't think too much of it. She's just more focused on quieting Chloe and getting back to bed. So she starts to drift off again. And within minutes, she says she thinks that she can hear somebody come in the house and is going up the stairs. And so her initial thought was, maybe this is Leslie's gentleman friend. Chloe's worked up a little bit again and she thought, oh God, <laughs> Didn't want to go through it again, but didn't want to be a spoiled, you know, a, a spoiled sport. Wanted to be a, a team player and support for her girl. So she just stayed in the bedroom with Chloe, focusing on, again, just calming her down. She's still trying to drift off, ignore anything that she's hearing. But it's an older house and everywhere you stepped, you could you could hear it. And the longer you're in a house, the more familiar you are with the sounds and you can kind of get a sense of where you're hearing them. At first, you could hear the steps coming uh, from Leslie's room, but then they started walking towards Adrian's room. Then all of a sudden, she says she hears this big, loud bump in Adrian's room, and she's like, oh, okay, maybe it's not actually a visitor of Leslie's. It's a visitor of Adrian's. She knew that he, she had this on-again, off-again boyfriend, and it must have been him. A few minutes go by where she's just kind of hearing, it's like a, a thumping sound, but easy to be confused with other possible, you know, bumping of the bed sounds that she's already kind of thinking in her head. And then all of a sudden she just hears this blood curdling, terrifying scream and it's Adrian and she's just like, oh my God, like, help me, please help me. She starts to panic because she's not even really able to compute what's going on. She just went from thinking there's w one gentleman here visiting one roommate, then it's possibly another, and they're doing something, and she's just focusing on quieting her dog down. And she she just starts panicking, like, not knowing what to do to help. She says that she opens her door, wanting to run upstairs, but she just froze in fear. As she's standing there, all of a sudden, she just hears this, like, really heavy, fast footsteps coming towards her coming down the stairs. And the second she hears that, she, her just natural instinct, her fight or flight was to run. And in her panic, she runs, but she runs out the back door into the backyard where she's surrounded by this like six foot fence. So there's no way to get out. She didn't run out the front of the door. So she just sat there silent, hiding still as she could, but she can still kind of hear sounds coming from the house and a struggle of this person trying to get out. And she ultimately hears this rustling within the blinds because they were wooden. So they made like a really loud clinking sound. And then all of a sudden, footsteps running off into the night. She just sat there for a moment, processing, hyperventilating, trying to regain her courage and strength to go back into the house. So she goes in and she's standing up the stairs just paralyzed like physically wanting to go up the stairs but unable to move and she calls up and she says like Adrian are you okay and she's screaming crying she's like no so Lauren ran to the landline that was in the kitchen to call 911 but when she picked it up the phone was dead so she yells for Leslie to help help her with Adrian and she doesn't get an answer from Leslie Everything is going a mile a minute. She's 
freaking out because the landline is not connecting. And then not even thinking just in that instant about her cell phone, she wanted to see what was going on with her friends. So she's cautiously like making her way up the stairs, terrified, but I don't think that you could have ever prepared to walk into what she saw. She walked into Adrian's room and she sees Adrian crouched down behind her bed. She is still alive, but she's bleeding so heavily. And at this point, she's unable to talk. She's just making sounds. There's so much blood in the room that as Lauren's trying to get to her, she's slipping. And as she's tending to Adrian, she looks off to the side. And at this point, she sees Leslie in Adrian's room, face down in a pool of blood. It was at this second, she just clicks like, I, I, I am no help right here. I need to go and get help. She goes down, she gets her cell phone, she calls for help, and she ran outside where she knew that the reception was stronger on her cell phone. And she called 911. It's a an emergency. What are you reporting? Oh my God, we got attacked. Who attacked you? I don't know what happened. Okay. Most of my roommates were hurt. Oh my God. Because I think that's on. Like, our Do you know who might have done this? No. Oh my God. There was a point where the 911 call had cut out and because she had called on her cell phone, it actually went to a dispatch that was further from where they were. So that added a lot of frustration and panic for her. And then she's also contending with her, the thought that I don't know who did this. I never saw this person. Did they actually leave? Are they coming back? Are they out here waiting? So she ran into her garage with Chloe, got into her car, and she just started driving up and down the street, not wanting to stop the vehicle. And, you know, by chance, this person's watching and just waiting for her to stop. And they're going to run into the vehicle and attack her. So she just kept driving, pleading with 911 to get somebody there. And that she thought that, like, her friends were dying. If not, like, they were already dead and they needed help right now. When paramedics did arrive, they went up to Adrian's room and they found both Leslie and Adrian dead at this point. It looked like Adrian had been able to get a portable phone and still had it in her hand to try to call for help, but just didn't get the chance. Both of them had died from multiple, multiple stab wounds. Even though Lauren essentially was hearing things, not even knowing at the time when it was first starting what she was hearing, there wasn't really much that she could help with. She didn't see anybody. So the investigators began their investigation and they did a very thorough job at collecting a lot of items on scene. They had collected over 260 pieces of potential evidence. And a few of those things was under uh, the window where uh, Lauren believed the intruder entered and, and exited from. There was this bag of uh, black zip ties and it was, it was in another bag and it was tied around with like a rubber band. There was also two cigarette butts found in different areas of the outside of the house. And what investigators believed to be was a drop of the killer's blood outside the broken window. On top of collecting all of this evidence, they also had sent out bloodhounds to follow a scent from the intruder near that window. But unfortunately, it only led them a few blocks away from the house and then it disappeared on the highway. I can only imagine how much this shook the community when all of this was being released. This is like such a peaceful area. And then you wake up after Halloween to find out there's been a double murder of two young women in their home on Halloween night. Authorities were trying their best to make everybody feel as safe as they could, letting them know that they're collecting all of this evidence. On top of that, they had interviewed like 1,300 people. They went to everybody in the neighborhood, asked them if they saw anything, collected around 200 DNA samples, but DNA takes time. So really the main thing that they were wanting was somebody to come forward, anybody to just like th think of somebody that they've met in their life or, or something that just didn't look right that evening. And you know, the the classic, if you if you think you saw something, no matter how big or small, please share it because you you don't know what what that could lead to. Learning about this, I really felt for Lauren being 
a surviving roommate, the only survivor in this house and not having a description of who did this to her friends. She's constantly racking her brain like, did I know this person? Was she also intended to be killed and they're coming back for her? Could she have done more? Like so much guilt on herself as well. And then that leads to a lot of assumptions from people who don't know the situation or where her thoughts were at. One thing that detectives were leaning towards was that they believed Leslie was the intended victim. And kind of why I wanted to just like preface that one incident, I guess, if you want to call it, that happened at the house a couple nights before and why Lauren's thought process was the way that it was, was because everyone was just kind of like, pointing the finger like this th this was Leslie's lifestyle and they also thought that based on the scene she was attacked first and that it was quite quick and and vicious the evidence indicated that at the time of the initial attack she was asleep and it woke her up and she attempted to run away from her killer and headed towards Adrian's room Adrian must have heard what happened, was trying to defend her friend, and then also died in this process. Leslie wasn't the only one who had men in her life, though. Adrian also was seeing somebody shortly after she was hired by the city. She started dating a gentleman named Christian Lee, and they both admitted that the relationship was rocky. It was on again, off again. She wanted more of a serious commitment. He wanted to be with her, but he wasn't quite ready for that level of commitment. But up until Halloween night, they were still in contact with each other and she had gone to Christian's house after she was done handing out candy um, to go and hang around there for a couple hours. Christian was brought to the police station and he was interviewed the day that they found Adrian murdered. They actually showed up at his house. He was sleeping. They pounded on the door, woke him up and said that they needed him to come with them to answer some questions they had. And all that they would say was that there was a break-in at Adrian's and there were injuries and they needed to talk. So he agrees. He goes to the police station where eventually after repeatedly asking what's going on, is she okay, can I please talk to her, they tell Christian, no, you can't, Adrian's been murdered. And investigators who were there in the room and watching in the other room said that he just completely fell apart. He was crying so hard that they left and gave him a moment to compose himself and he admitted when they came back that they had struggles they were not the perfect relationship and he definitely wasn't the perfect person but he said he really loved Adrian he loved Adrian from the minute he saw her they actually met also through volleyball very popular among this group I guess both he and his best friend were interested in her and his best friend beat him to asking her out, which he was pretty miffed about. So when it didn't work out with his friend, he like immediately jumped on the opportunity to shoot his shot and they started dating. And he said that one of the, the bigger issues, aside from the commitment, because he was really wanting to try to work on that, was that he did have a temper and it was something that Adrian didn't like. She was trying to help him kind of work through it to see like, where is this stemming from? But she wasn't a pushover by any means. Like she was really headstrong and stuff. So they both butted heads and that was kind of the, the reason for a lot of their arguments. Despite all of their issues though, he said he knew her friends didn't think the best of, the, of him. He knew that Aunt Adrian could do and deserved better than him. But all of that being said, like he loved her so much she was one of his best friends that he could tell anything to and just feel so comfortable with. And he would never, ever hurt her or ever be able to hurt Leslie. He even said that the past two days that they had uh, spent together, it was two of the best days that they had ever spent together. And things were really looking like they were on a good track. So there would have never even been motive or reason, not like he was feeling he was losing her or anything. Even when she left his house, uh, on Halloween and got home right before going to bed, she sent him a text message basically saying the same thing, like the the day before was just like the perfect day. And she wished that every day that they hung out together 
could be like that. And so he was feeling really hopeful for their future. So he let them take his phone. He gave vials of blood to be checked against the evidence that found was found at the home. And then at that point, he was he was released. While this is all going on, Adrian's poor mom, she had to find out about her daughter's death while she was on vacation with two of her girlfriends in Australia visiting her younger daughter who was living out there. And her mom said that she had climbed the Sydney Harbour Bridge that afternoon and even just looked and thought, wow, Adrian would love this. Even though she had three daughters, you love all of your children equally so much, but there's like a different, you know, there's different like categories of the relationships. And with Adrian and her mom, they were closer than just mother and daughter. They were best friends. Adrian was always including her mother in events and, and hangouts like with her friends, barbecues, like all of that stuff. So it wasn't unusual for her to think about Adrian and be like, oh my God, she would, she would love to, to be taking in this moment right now. And she was going to be taking it in soon. She was actually scheduled to go to also visit her sister in Australia in mid-November. And she was going with a really good friend of hers named Lily, whose wedding was supposed to be in Hawaii that Halloween weekend. It didn't end up going through though because the summer prior, Lily had broken things off with her fiance, Eric. They had gotten back together, but they were deciding, you know, like, we'll just hold off on the wedding right now. And Lily planned to go with Adrian on this trip to Australia for two weeks. This was a newer friendship. They had only been friends for about a year, but they became very close very quickly. They met at work, so they would hang out together during their lunch. After work, they would do appies, drinks, manis, petties, weekends, they hung out together. They just considered each other among their closest friends, even though that they didn't know each other their whole lives. They really felt like it. And after they had met, they were just joined at the hip. Usually if you saw one, you saw the other. They were also each other's confidant when it came to those hiccups and bumps in the roads in relationships. And it was Adrian that Lily had talked to when she was thinking about calling off her wedding. Lily and her fiance had been together much longer than Adrian and Christian had been. They were also on and off though. They had been for eight years since high school and they're described as kind of like an odd couple. Uh, Lily was much more like Adrian, very outgoing, confident, not a pushover. And Eric was more reserved, a man of very few words, didn't really like much besides going to play pool at a local club and just kind of keeping to himself and spending time with Lily. So the summer prior in 2003, when they were having a lot of arguments, Lily decided that things were just not really going in the direction that she wanted. And as hard as it was to try to cancel all of the plans that had already transpired with the wedding and stuff, she just didn't feel right going through with it, so she called things off. They separated very briefly, but got back together, and then they just decided, let's just focus on working on our relationship before even like adding the pressure of another wedding date. So that's why when Adrian said that she was gonna be going to Australia in November, it seemed like a really good idea for Lily to take the opportunity and go. I can only imagine like how hard it would have been to probably, even though if you're still with your 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 partner again there's no wedding planned this would have been like your your honeymoon time it's a good distraction go and make new memories do it with a really good friend of yours and both of them were so excited to to go sadly we know that that never happened and instead of going on this trip Lily and her other good friend, Ben, were left planning a candlelight vigil for Adrian instead. One thing that I learned about Adrian's close friends and her family finding out about her murder was that it almost felt very surreal because they looked at Adrian and they just kind of saw her as invincible. And there was a time in her life, 10 years prior to her murder, where she had cheated death when she was 16 years old and it kind of felt like you know she was she's coming back bigger badder better and 
no harm could come her way. She survived a almost fatal car crash. The car that she was in had rolled three times and she hit her head on the pavement through a window that was open. I mean, just saying it, you, you don't feel like someone's really gonna be coming back from that, but she just always had this, this fight in her. And by miracle, she survived. She went back to school within a few months. She did suffer with um, temporary brain damage because of the accidents, which led to um, some memory loss. And that was probably one of like the most frustrating parts of her healing, she would tell her friends, was just because she was wrapping up school and it affected her trying to like retain information and stuff. But she got through it. She healed. She came back stronger than ever and she totally excelled in life. It was only four months before her death that she had celebrated her 10 year um, surviving death anniversary is what she called it. And she and her close friends, Lily and Lauren, they all took the day off and they went to an amusement park and they rode all of the scary rides to celebrate. Leslie's family and friends also couldn't grasp what they were learning when they heard about the murders either. It was actually Leslie's mom, Kathy's good friend, who reached out to her because Leslie's family was kind of all over the United States. They weren't in, you know, one neighborhood where the news could spread. They were hearing it at different times. And it was Kathy's friend who saw on the news that two girls in Napa had been killed and she reached out to her and said, have you talked to Leslie? And she said, well, I did yesterday, not today. Why? And she said, I, you, like, I think you need to call the police because she could be dead. And she was like, why are you saying this? Like she's in Napa. She's working at a winery. She's got her three girlfriends. Like there's, it was just not processing. And she was kind of almost like a little bit defensive. And her friend said, there were two girls that were murdered on the street that Leslie lives on. You need to call the police, which she did. And that's how they found out. They were like, we've we've been trying to locate family of yours to tell you. And they confirmed that, unfortunately, Leslie was one of the victims. Unfortunately, her family also had no leads to give the investigators. They said, you know, Leslie's so popular. She's loved by so many people. There's nobody out there that would have any reason to harm her. She, had, she does not have an enemy out there, which I can assume is so frustrating for their family because you're trying to give a description of your loved one to people who don't know and they're doing their job and their job is to investigate a situation and, and solve it. And they can only be given certain pieces of, you know, this big, big, big ass, <laughs> big ass puzzle to try to try and make sense of it, but you're missing so much at the beginning. And what Leslie's family felt like they were holding on to was, like I mentioned before, trying to look at it from Leslie being the target. And they felt almost like it was essentially saying, not this was Leslie's fault, but this what this happened because of Leslie. This is because somebody was either obsessed with Leslie or she was bringing, you know, people who she didn't know into the home. And I don't even know what I would do in that situation if I was their family because you're kind of left defending this person, trying to redraw the investigation into a different light. And it just kind of kept circling back to, oh, this must have been somebody in Leslie's life that caused this to happen. Now they did obtain DNA samples from everybody that had interacted with Leslie, coworkers, any men that she was dating, friends of hers, including Lee's father, who was the, the, the gentleman that she had broken up with and the dad was repeatedly calling by telephone and had called that night. But after running all of the tests against everybody they interviewed, none of that DNA that they pulled from people they interviewed matched the DNA that was on the scene that the investigators believed belonged to the killer. So this just causes everybody to be on edge, not just Leslie and Adrian's family and friends, but everybody within the community. And something 
that happens from that is like people's imaginations go, they're, they're sharing their theories, and then just rumors just to start to take a life of their own. And some of them were that all three girls were mixed up with drugs and that they were murdered because of it. Another was that Francis Ford Coppola, the uh, owner of the winery that Leslie worked for, who, if you don't know who Francis Ford Coppola is, he's he made the Godfather movies, Dracula, The Outsiders, tons of movies that I'm sure you have watched. There was a rumor that he had mob ties and that the ladies were collateral damaged and, and killed because of this. There was also talk that maybe the Zodiac killer had resurfaced and they were the first victims from this this new killing spree that was about to take place. And then there were even accusations that were thrown towards Lauren, much like I think we see recently with the surviving Idaho Four roommates. All of the rumors were looked into or at least kind of acknowledged and said that they were looking into all forms of leads that were coming in and that at that point there was just nothing to go off of. There was no truth to really anything that was catching a lot of steam. At one point there was a $100,000 reward posted but nobody came forward and as unfortunately happens so much, a case starts to lose steam. Not just like public interest either, but there's only so much that you can go off of and time time passes and people try to move forward, which for the friends and family of these victims is so hard. I've said it so many times. We have to be really mindful when we watch and consume true crime cases because this isn't just like storytelling. I'm not just here making up a story that I think is going to be interesting and entertaining for you. Like these are real people. And even though we move on after the case and with our day, the the surviving family members of these victims, they can't just like move on with their life, especially when it's not solved. Like it's, there's just always this empty hole and there's nothing that can be done to fix it. I will say like Leslie and Adrian's friends and family did amazing to do their best to keep the case in public attention. They spoke with all forms of media, including for the 48-hour special that I had seen years ago. And they just did their best to keep everybody talking, keep bringing awareness to it. In that episode, there was a clip that just stuck out to me. And it was from Adrian's friend, Lily, pleading from anybody that was in the area to think about who you might know in your circle and see if, you know, you can analyze and see if somebody was acting different. Was there injuries? Is there something in your gut telling you that something's off and potentially they have information? With all that being said of of people who are mourning every day for their loved ones and trying to solve their murders, there is also a point in life, I think, where you start to realize that life is very precious and you find ways of honoring your loved one that has passed and trying to live each day the best that you can while still trying to find a balance of fighting for truth and justice. I know family members of victims that I've covered on the channel that I've gotten close with that is something that they try to explain to me and I I just I I can't tell you how strong these people are who have experienced this in their life and try to make best of just like a gut-wrenching situation a situation that none of us watching right now or listening right now want to ever experience and so While fighting for justice, they're also trying to balance living in the moment. And in February 2005, Adrienne's best friend Lily decided that after calling off her wedding, she was ready to marry her fiancé Eric because he had been such like a rock for her through this grief. 
one of the first things that she did was reach out to Adrian's mom, Arlene, and just almost ask for her blessing and hope that she would come to it. She felt very close to almost like to Adrian when she was with her mom and vice versa. Arlene thought the world of Lily as well, so she was very honored to be invited. She even read a passage from Song of Solomon. And then Lily had played the song She Will Be Loved by Maroon 5, which was Adrian's favorite song at the time. And she played that in her honor to kind of make it feel like she was there. It must have been super emotional on all sides, even just trying to process, think about it and put myself in in their shoes. You're you're like dealing with two huge emotions. You're like celebrating something and it's just a really joyous time. And then it's a reminder that Leslie and Adrian should also be there celebrating. Not only that, but that the person who took them from their family and friends is not found. And each moment that is going by is pulling you further and further away from the truth. Like I said though, the, the example of keeping a case and a story in front of people's attention. This is just such an amazing example of of how to do it and not let that frustration take you down. And also find a power if you are a friend or family member of somebody whose case isn't solved, that you you have a lot of power to keep the momentum going, not just kind of rely on law enforcement to do it, not saying like that because like there's going to be a bad job or anything, but there's so much more that it entails besides just like the back end stuff where there's so much information usually that isn't shared even with family and friends to protect a case. And it can feel like things are getting stale and they're not being solved, but you can get creative and find ways of constantly keeping the the story at the forefront of people's minds and Leslie and Adrian's friends really did an amazing job at doing that. One thing Leslie's friends did was the following year, August 2005, to keep the story of Leslie going was she put together something called the Raising Race. This was something she organized in Leslie's memory and it was to raise funds for the Calvary Home for Children, which is a charity that was very close to Leslie's heart. Basically, this was their version of the Amazing Race. Leslie's friend who put it on actually went on Amazing Race three weeks after Leslie's death. While she was on that season, she met survivor players, legends, um, Rob and Amber. And she got to know them and they were so touched by her story that they actually came to support this. It was a huge success and they raised money to go towards a cottage for the charity that they were going to build in Leslie's name. So these are really great things, like I said, that the family and friends are doing to keep public interest. It had almost been a year since the their deaths and the investigators had not released much information publicly. The only thing that they confirmed was that the blood left at the scene, they were able to determine that it was male DNA. This was all everybody really had to hold on to. They never released information about other items they found, like those cigarette butts that I mentioned earlier on in the video. So in September 2005, they decide to publicly release information about these cigarette butts saying that they were found at the scene and that they were a very specific brand. They were Camel Turkish Gold and they had only been on the market for four months at the time of the murders. They know that the cigarette butts are really important because uh, tests revealed that the DNA on the cigarette matched the blood DNA found in the house. They didn't want to show all their cards though. So they didn't say anything about that DNA. They just revealed to the public that there's these two cigarette butts found in two areas of the of the parameter of the outside of the house. One was in the front, one was in the back. And they mentioned that they were smoked down to the filter, which indicated that the person was there for some time, waiting, taking their time. 
at this press conference, they asked the public to think about who in their inner circle was a camel smoker, camel the brand, not like a, like a camel, and who had switched to this new line of cigarettes. They asked Lauren um, if any of their friends, because Lauren would associate with people in their crew, which is usually the, the first place that you want to start looking at, people closest to you. And they want to know if she knows any smokers. And at first she says no. But the more she thought about it, she remembered that Eric Koppel, Adrian's good friend Lily's fiance, now husband, had been at the house the day that her and Adrian had initially moved in. He was one of uh, the people that helped set them up, had beer and pizza after, and he smoked. So she just mentioned that to detectives and said, she, you know, she didn't even really think about it before because like he was, not that he was like a, a, like a thought in her mind. He was just so quiet, so shy that there was really nothing that ever stood out about him in any of the time that they hung out. So they look through their database of people that they had spoken to and they had him as Adrian's best friend's fiance, but he, he had never, his DNA had never been checked. So they ask Lauren if she happens to have his phone number and she says no, but she knew the company that he worked for. So they called the company, left a message with the secretary to have him call back. But two weeks passed, they hadn't heard anything and Lauren had followed up to see if there was any news. Lauren said she was told that they weren't able to reach them, reach him. So she says that, you know, him and Lily are married. So they call the house number that Lily had and they left a message for Eric. In the meantime, they are still keeping the pressure on the public. They, they've been holding on to this, this bomb about these cigarettes and they have more to release and they're thinking like, okay, if, if somebody is watching and they know anything, it's, I think, a lot more intimidating and scary to slowly start releasing what you have because the, the person who did this usually is always waiting to see at what point the investigation is at. So next they reveal the reason why they want to know about these cigarette butts is because the DNA found on the butts is the DNA that was taken from Adrian's bedroom. Doing this, they felt like, okay, this is like really turning up the pressure. It's giving a lot of validity to this evidence, which is going to potentially make people take it more seriously and come forward. I don't think that they expected the person that came forward was going to be the killer. It was a few days after this information was released on September 27th, 2005. All of the detectives that had been working on Adrian and Leslie's case had left the station for the evening. And all of a sudden, Eric Koppel shows up with Lily and other family members of his. He basically said with this new information about the cigarettes being released, he knew that it was only a matter of time that he was going to get caught and he wanted to confess to killing Adrian and Leslie. His confession virtually had no reasoning. He had said that he had written a suicide note. In it, he had talked about this dark side that he had that nobody knew about and he just couldn't take it anymore. He had mailed it to his brother and a couple other family members and his brother got it before Eric had taken his life. His brother confronted him and it was him who basically encouraged Eric to go into the station and confess. Allegedly, within these notes, he did talk about being jealous of Lily and Adrian's relationship. He said on the night of Halloween, he and Lily were at a party. They were playing some drinking games that he was losing. Therefore, he was drinking a lot. He and Lily got into an argument because he had said something that embarrassed her. She drove them to their apartment, but she dropped him off and she went and stayed the night at her parents' house. Her parents just had happened to be in Hawaii because they had booked the Hawaii trip to be there for their wedding that weekend. And when they had called the wedding off, it was too late for them to 
get their money back. So they just decided to make a vacay out of it. So she went there to her parents' house and he said he was so drunk, he passed out. At some point he woke up and he went into the garage and grabbed some zip ties. He then said he grabbed a four inch knife that he thinks he also got from the garage. And then the next thing he remembers is his car pulling onto Dorset Street and just parking under a street light and him walking to the front of the garage of Leslie, Lauren and Adrian's home. And then the security light coming on and off as he was smoking a cigarette. He then said he went to this small window that was left to the front of the front door. He pried it open with his knife and it, it popped open very easily. This was the living room. And he said he could hear Lauren's dog growling in her room, but he just walked past it, went upstairs to where Le Leslie and Adrian's room rooms were. He said he walked into one of the rooms and fell asleep on a pile of clothes and all of a sudden the light turns on and he jumped on the bed not wanting the woman to scream. Now the way he explained this, it, it, it sounded in, like it, he was trying to say that it was in Adrian's room, but I believe it was Leslie's because her friends said she had always had clothes everywhere and the investigators felt like she was attacked first and then ran for help and made it to Adrian's room. He said from this point, he experienced just like a full blackout. The only thing he remembers is being hit in the face by Adrian and feeling panicked when they locked eyes with each other. And he, he said, if I stabbed her, I don't remember. He said then he heard noise from the other room. He's saying this was Leslie's, but the scene shows like that it was Adrian's. He walked in and then blacked out and has no re recollection of attacking anybody. After the, the confrontation, as he explains it, he ran downstairs. He said maybe he injured himself, climbed uh, out the same window he came through, went to his car, and then he, he remembers throwing the knife in there and then just driving home, but had no idea where any, any of the, the murder weapon or blood or anything like that went. So long had passed, I, I don't believe that there was a chance to search his vehicle and find any evidence. Regardless, his DNA was linked in the house anyways. He said when he got home, he immediately built a fire, took everything that he was wearing off and burned him. I cannot imagine what that moment would have been like finding out that it was it was Eric especially for Adrian and and Leslie's family I mean Adrian's mom who was at their wedding read scripture to them and then for Leslie's family there was this sense of relief of it being solved and 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 then almost frustration because for this whole time it was almost like everybody was pushing that Leslie was the the sole target and and that even though it was never like said out loud it's how they felt like that that it was her fault and then there's confusion because it's like who who the heck is Eric like Leslie didn't even know him he was literally under everybody's radar there was a point where Ben who was very good friends with Lily and Adrian, when he found out, they said, Eric Koppel, he's like, he just, it didn't even go, <laughs> like, compete. he's like, who's Eric? Even though he knows this is one of his good friend's husbands. And then it's like, oh my God, like Eric, because he just like, he just didn't really talk, but not in a really creepy way either, people said. You know, like sometimes there's description of people where it's like, yeah, they, they really kept to themselves. They were introverted. They didn't say much. And it was like creepy. It was just like, kind of just, nothing. Even the production company and the, 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 the film crew for 48 hours who did the special covering the murder, trying to draw attention to it to help solve the case, he, he was in the room. Like Lily spoke on the program. That's when she was pleading for somebody to come forward. Somebody out there must know something. And as she's saying this, she's the person who might know somebody, but but doesn't, and he's sitting just feet away from her as she's saying this. The police did get a lot of heat after he was arrested because then it came to light that he was never formally interviewed or had a DNA sample taken from him, and it wasn't up until this point of the information about the cigarettes being released and Lauren sharing his name 
that they found out, even though they kept saying like, we, we've we looked at everybody within the inner circle in these girls' lives, and this is the fiance of Adrian's closest friends. So after Eric's arrest, um, just to formally confirm, he did finally provide his DNA and it did match the cigarettes and the blood found in the home. In January of 2007, uh, Eric Cobble was sentenced to life in prison. He ended up taking a plea deal. This was something that the DA as well as Adrian and Leslie's families had agreed on if the uh, death penalty was taken off of the table. It sounds like it was kind of what they felt like was the right thing to do at that time. Just word uh, around the street was that there was possibility of an insanity uh, defense coming. And that seemed a little bit clear when he had given his confession because all of a sudden there's these you know, blank moments of time, especially any time he's getting to the part of the story where there would have actually been like physical stabbing. He's saying that he blacked out. But I mean, in the same sense, there's also ways around that too. Like he he drove there. He was able to remember going to the garage, get the knife, drive there, burn his clothes. So yeah, but I understand why families want to do that type of stuff because reliving all of that and hearing what happened in court over again, the chance of it not going through or being a mistrial and having to do it all over again just sounds even more excruciating. You're just kind of reliving it over and over and over again. And at least this ensured that he was going to take responsibility and spend the rest of his life in prison. Something that I think was quite shocking for a lot of people who knew the girls was that Lily had a chance to speak at sentencing, as did Adrian and Leslie's family. And Lily spoke about knowing a gentler side of Eric and not knowing a side of, of him that could ever hurt her best friend. In the same sense, she told him that she supported him and that there was nothing that he could do in the world that would make her love him less. Eric also spoke and he apologized to the family and he kind of put the blame on the death of his grandfather, which put him into a depression. And then there was, were things going on with, within his family that just further aggravated it. And when he added alcohol to the mix to try to cover and cope with his emotions, it just made the depression even worse. And eventually just turned him into somebody that he also didn't know. Eric, there is nothing in this world that you could do to make me love you less. I am a broken man. Oh, that sucks. A man splintered by penetrating awareness of my own potential for wickedness. Based on what I know now, all of these years later, Lily is not married to Eric anymore. There was a lot of public, I don't know, finger pointing accusations. Like, did she know? Did she not know? I personally don't think that she did know. And then just based on information from the investigators who spoke with her when she went with Eric to the station for him to confess, they just said like she was just in just this state of shock, even though she knew from her husband that he had been the one who did this. It was just not processing or feeling very real. And I, 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 I've never been in this situation. I can't judge. I don't ever want to be in a situation that she would be in. So I, I can kind of maybe understand that in those like early moments, especially in the trial, just with like everything going on, you're trying to figure out like who this person is because you just like don't know. And I, I can imagine it probably felt like like a nightmare, just like living in this dream state of it not being real and then holding on to hope that just like something was going to explain it all away. I try my best to kind of wrap up the cases with just some 
something positive, even though it's like so hard to even try to see any positive in this. But I, I read a part when I was reading the, the story that was written about this case and it just like got me so emotional. And it was that, um, it was from Adrian's mom and she talked about how she had gone back to Australia a year after she found out about Adrian's murder and she climbed the Sydney Harbour Bridge again and she took in the scene all over again and did it through the eyes of Adrian since she never got a chance to go back and just really tried to take in the moment and has made a conscious effort to live life to the fullest like her daughter would have wanted her to. And for Leslie at the winery that she worked at, there's this, this small vineyard that is next to the estate house and the employees have kind of like taken that over maintained it and have renamed it for leslie which brings like this comfort to her friends and family because they feel like they can go there and they can visit it for years and years and years to come and talk about it with you know their loved ones and and they can go and visit it because you know you just keep you just keep producing that vino, man. And Leslie gets to live on through that. So I know that it doesn't make any of this better. And I'm just like, ugh. This is one of those cases that has never, never left my my heart, my mind. If I go to Napa, which I would still absolutely love to, I would most definitely be keeping these women in my heart there. And I'd love to go and pay my respects to that little area of the winery if it or the yeah the vineyard and send some love to Leslie and her family all right that is it for me today you guys if you haven't already please don't forget to like and subscribe it means the world to me I love and I appreciate you please also make sure that you are still subscribed because it breaks my heart when I like see comments lately I've been seeing a lot of them from people who've been like oh my god like I used to watch you so long ago I've been trying to find you. I haven't been able to find you. And I finally found you and I was unsubscribed or that you have the notification bell on and it's not notifying you. So just like maybe both the, check that both of those things are on. Okay, I love you so much. The answer to today's riddle is what occurs once in a minute, twice in a moment, but never in a thousand years. And the answer is the letter M. It's a sneaky one, isn't it? All right. I'll see you in the next video. I will miss you terribly. Until then, make sure to love each other, love yourself, and I will see you soon. Bye.